The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, curses, hexes, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep that results from listening to this podcast. This is the Scream Kings podcast. I'm Max George. And I'm Nathaniel Darkish. This podcast is perfectly splendid. Oh, man. You're a little bit too good at that. I, I practiced all night. <laughs> I mean, good thing it took us an extra day to, to record then, so you could really just master your, your little British girl voice. Should we probably tell everyone what happened recently, which is why we had to reschedule last night's recording, Nathaniel? Yeah, um, <laughs> so our uh, our recording schedule has been a little bit off lately, as you've probably noticed, and that is because I uh, just had a new baby in my family, so that was is big news, a <laughs> brand new baby girl, everything's going well, um, my, my son is adapting to being a big brother, uh, but yeah, so I expect probably our, our next few episodes at least to be maybe a little less uh, than ideally consistent just because of, you know, all of the, the trickiness that comes with balancing getting used to having a, a new human being in, in my house. So would you say that having the new baby girl in your family is perfectly splendid? <laughs> Splendiferous indeed. I'm going to try and work that in as much as I can in this episode, because we have a fun episode ahead. It might be a controversial discussion. <gasps> dun dun dun! We've never been controversial, ever. No, and we've never disagreed on anything, ever, ever, ever before. Never. <laughs> but yeah, so today we are talking about The Haunting of Bly Manor, the new Netflix series uh, that was the follow-up to Haunting of Hill House, helmed by Mike Flanagan again. Uh, but we're also kind of getting into some of the the source material as well. We're going to look at the Turn of the Screw novella by Henry James. The, it is a, a, the 1898 classic horror novella, uh, as well as looking at the original film version of Turn of the Screw, which is The Innocence from 1961. Uh, we're going to mostly be focusing in on Bly Manor, but... Definitely going to do uh, some due diligence with those those other two as well, because I, I feel like it definitely adds to our conversation. Well, and we want it to really focus on kind of Bly Manor, not only as part of kind of this greater mythos of uh, the Train of the Screw, but also, and correct me, I can't remember, Turning or Turn of Screw? The Turn of the Screw. The Turn of the Screw. Wow, it's been a while since I've read this book. So Bly Manor, of course, is inspired by this and the innocence, but I think it's going to be a fun exercise to also kind of separate it and, and review it as a standalone itself as well. Yeah, and I, I think it's also kind of worth noting, like, up at the head of this episode, that, you know, these are, are far from the only versions of Turn of the Screw that are out there. You know, even earlier this same very year, there was a, a film adaptation that did very poorly, Turning, which, Ugh. yeah, exactly. I unfortunately sat through. Yeah, and I, I know that one d- didn't land well with, with audiences. It has been adapted as radio dramas, operas, films, stage, television. Uh, there was a 1950 Broadway play. There was a chamber opera in 1954. Like, this is definitely a very uh, influential piece of literature. And so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's both significant to look at how it's currently being adapted with The Haunting of Blind Manor, but also, yeah, kind of looking at, at that greater conversation because, yeah, like, I, th- I think there's a reason that this story has resonated with audience so, or audiences so much that it keeps coming back. Like, there's no putting it down even, you know, multiple times in one year. Which is funny, because I I think that harkens back to the theme of the show in some regard as well. It just won't stay dead. Before we get 
too far in and Nathaniel being your English major literary buff, I, I would benefit from kind of a synopsis of the turn of the screw. Also some information about the innocence. But before we do that, I just want to remind our listeners that this is a spoiling podcast. I know we haven't said it for a while, but if you are ready to read Turn of the Screw and watch The Innocence and finish Blind Manor, this is not the episode for you. <laughs> Go yes. do all of that first, then come back and listen, because we're going to hash it apart. In particular, the ending of Blind Manor is pretty controversial. So if you do not want to be spoiled, maybe pause and, and finish what you're watching and then come back to us. All right, so Turn of the Screw. So uh, again, it was written in uh, 1898. It was a novella by Henry James, so you know, pretty short. Uh, and it was originally written uh, in a serial format, uh, which is pretty common in, in the day. And straight up, when Henry James wrote it, it was completely just a money grab. He didn't actually really try to do anything too deep with it. And so kind of a lot of the, the depth of the pieces is largely accidental, which is fine. Because honestly, you know, what, whatever the writer intends is only a part of the equation when we're looking at, you know, interpreting a piece of literature. Well, and I think a lot of times we get caught in that trap of looking for something that is deeper in meaning. So I think it's kind of brilliant that it wasn't intended to be that, but kind of fell into place. Yeah, and, and you know, I know that like kind of after the fact, he, he started to see more depth in it himself. But yeah, his original intent was just, hey, ghost stories are in this year. I need some money. Let's write a ghost story. All right, so... How the story is written, uh, it is written as a frame narrative, where basically just some people are telling ghost stories around a fire. One dude just says, oh, hey, like, I know uh, this this former governess, and I and she told me her story, and I have it written down. Here, let me tell you this story. Then we get into the, the main story. It never actually revisits this, so I don't really know why it starts with the frame narrative. Maybe Henry James just forgot that he started it out that way because he was writing it episodically. Uh, kind of the key points here. There is this governess that gets hired, uh, hired by a man who is wealthy. Uh, he doesn't, you know, he, he is responsible for his niece and nephew. He owns a manor house out in the country in Bly. He lives in London. He has, doesn't want anything to do with the children. The governess shows up. Flora, a little girl, has been living there and been uh, being taken care of by Miss Gross, the housekeeper, and Miles has been away at boarding school, but he comes back pretty early on in the story. She gets to to know Flora, is totally charmed by her. Miles comes right after a letter arrives saying that he's been expelled from school, but he doesn't want to talk about it. Like, well, yeah, he 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 never talks about it. The governess is is kind of afraid to bring it up because she also is, is really charmed by him. She, she keeps worrying about this, but nothing too significant has happened. Shortly after arriving and spending some time with the children, she starts to see these two figures kind of around the property, a man and a woman. They tend to just kind of come and go at will. And, and at first she just thinks, like, what is going on? Are there, you know, other people that work here that I don't know about? But over time, she starts to learn from Mrs. Gross that it is the previous governess who died, Miss Jessel. Uh, and, uh, another employee, uh, Peter Quint, and that Jessel and Quint had this really close relationship. They spent a lot of time with the kids, and so the the governess starts to be really convinced that these two kids are aware of the ghosts, even though they will not acknowledge it. There is a, an incident where Flora leaves the house while Miles is like playing music. It's almost as if he's trying to distract her. She she runs out to go find her. They fi uh, She finds her by the lake, and and she's convinced that Flora was talking to the ghost of Miss Jessel. But when she confronts her, Flora is just saying, no, 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 I've never seen this. Like, I don't want to ever see you again. She just, like, flips her lid. And so the governess says, says to Miss Gross, okay, take Flora away to her uncle. I'm going to try to work on Miles. You know, I, I want to find out what was the deal with him getting expelled. I think I can get through to him. I'm convinced that these kids are to a, a degree like either being possessed by these ghosts or being manipulated by them and i think i can get through to miles so it's so it's just her and miles and she sees the ghost of quint and the governess you know, tries to hide miles from seeing the ghost 
you know, who keeps trying to see it, and she just says, like, no, no, like, you don't have to be controlled by him anymore. After kind of struggling with him for a, a little bit, you know, keeping him from seeing the ghost, suddenly she looks down and sees that Miles has died in her arms. That's the end of the book. All right. So a little bit different, but I think we'll get into this, that the Haunting of Bly Manor holds true to a lot of that. Yes, for sure. Um, and that the innocence, so that original film adaptation... I saw him staring. Who, miss? The same man, the man on the tower. The tower? But now, just now, he was staring past me into the house as if he were hunting someone. Oh, what's he like, miss? Oh, he had dark, curling hair and the hardest, the coldest eyes. Is he... Would you say he was very handsome? Oh, yes, yes, handsome, handsome and obscene. I'll, I'll make a note is... Had the the screenplay was written by Truman Capote and William Archibald, as well as John Mortimer. They took the book pretty whole, wholesale. They added a few scenes. They added a little bit of dialogue. They definitely kind of fleshed it out just a teeny bit more. But as a whole, it's an extremely faithful adaptation. So it's it's kind of interesting to see how closely it follows the book. I, I would say the key difference. It's mostly in how that final scene plays out. Instead of her just shielding him from the ghost, she actually tries to get him to acknowledge the ghost. She tries to say, like, just say his name. Just, like, tell me, you know, who you're seeing, and then you'll be free of him because you've, you know, acknowledged it to me. You know, that's, that's the kind of approach that she's taking with Miles. And Miles actually finally does say, it's Quint, it's Quint. And then he collapses, and she thinks, oh, he's free of the, the possession or the influence of Quint. And then she goes and picks up, and she's like, yay, you're free! Uh, M- Miles? Miles? And she starts screaming, you know, he's dead. Then the credits roll. So, with that kind of framework in mind, I-, I do think we need to kind of move into The Haunting of Blind Manor, where this is kind of the meat of our episode. Before we do, I, I do just kind of want to point out a few key things about these two original pieces uh, that I-, I kind of want to bring to the forefront of our conversation before we jump into Blind Manor. Because I think it'll make our discussion of Bly Manor, I think, more meaningful if we do. One, just mostly a note on The Innocence. I think it's a movie that holds up very well. I The, the copy I watched of it was, like, the uh, Criterion version. So it was, like, really, really gorgeous in terms of, like, how clean it, it was visually. There's some really impressive uh, photography. Like, cinematography was gorgeous. It did some really trippy things at certain parts. There were there was like a dream sequence section that had like overlaying images of uh, nightmare imagery and things like that. That was really ahead of its time and quite jarring. And also the the film did some truly eerie things with its sound design. It was really really very impressive in a lot of ways. I, I liked it a lot. I would say the acting wasn't the very best. I will say the kid who was Miles really, really knocked it out of the park, though. He's also one of the kids from uh, Village of the Damned. Yeah, yeah, just a a note for everyone. The Innocence is definitely worth checking out. It's kind of hard to find these days, other than just going out and buying it, but it's definitely worth your time. The key thing I wanted to bring up before we jump into Blind Manor is kind of like this main theme that is present in both The Innocence and the original novella. And it is basically how these people how these adults are using children, like, like that, that, that relationship is, is definitely one of, of abuse, or at, at the very least, one of these adults are getting something from the children, and the children think that they're getting something from the adults, but they're really not. It's, it's very interesting to see, because I would say that, to me, was, was honestly the most important part. Like, I think that's why they, they named the film The Innocents. It's, you know, these children who are largely innocent in this whole thing, but are still being destroyed or harmed by these adults, you know, even after death. I think that's a, a, an important thing to be considering, and at least, like, to me, I would say that's the most important theme. That, that was just kind of the, the thing I wanted to point out, is that, like, this relationship between these adults and these children is what this story's about to me. And I, I, I think that is very subjective, which is fine. And we'll get into this, of course, with Bly, but I, I, I think Bly takes a lot of those themes and morphs them a little bit in good ways, and as we'll discuss, forgets them in a lot of bad ways. Especially with you talking about the innocence, and that's the name of this movie, like that just kind of turned a light bulb on in my head of, you know, a big flaw I see in the ending, and, and we'll get there. With that groundwork now, I, I do think we let's move into Bly.
I know what loss is. Your parents loved you so, so much. In a way, they'll always be here. So The Haunting of Blind Manor um, is by Mike Flanagan, um, and of course he did The Haunting of Hill House, which we've done an episode on um, a while back. And The Haunting of Hill House was one of the most, I don't know, spectacular uh, horror TV series I think I've seen in a very long time. It was beautifully well done, and if you listen to our episode about it, we really just were enthralled with the storytelling. So season two, it's a bit of a misnomer because The Haunting of Blind Manor isn't really a follow-up of anything to The Haunting of Hill House. It's its own story, and I would even argue that it's not even technically part of the same universe or anthology or anything. Really, they should be two different pieces of media. Would you agree? Yeah, and, and I think ultimately, like, Netflix separated them out so it's not like season one is one season two is the other like it it treats them as separate shows but it's definitely you know like a lot of the same creative team a lot of the same actors and so like it's i would say a spiritual second season without being directly a second season um and so as we've kind of discussed the haunting of Lai manor takes this turn of the screw and this innocence and really kind of gives us a modern take on it and instead of kind of diving into the plot, because I think we already really did that in some regard with our synopsis of the two other pieces of art, I think we just kind of dive into the pros and the cons here, Nathaniel, because we have a lot to say. Would you agree? I guess maybe we could just highlight a few of the key differences, just so that way we kind of get some of the, the context here. One of the key differences is that this is told as a frame narrative, which is kind of similar to the book. Uh, the, the, the Innocence was not told as a frame narrative. It starts out with with it being told as as you know a, a, a ghost story being told, but presumably this was, or it, it's it's being told right after a wedding rehearsal dinner, and is just told over the course of a single night. It is updated to be to uh, it set in the 1980s, uh, rather than in the late 1800s, as with the book. And um, some of the, the the key differences is that. Partway through the series, we start to have so, uh, some big departures from the source material, in that we have uh, another ghost present that is a big driving factor in a lot of the stuff that happens. We have the Lady of Bly, who, when when she first appears, she is a faceless ghost that comes and uh, is very violent in a lot of ways. She she tends to just like grab someone choke them to death, and just keep walking. She doesn't even realize that she's doing it. And the second-to-last episode gives us her origin story and shows us her many years before as as this sort of force of nature, almost. Yeah, and and that kind of central figurehead in the story really drives a lot of the drama and a lot of the plot, because I think Bly sees her as the real pivot point of the main characters. And the Lady of Bly, I think, is a very tragic and interesting figure, and the way they describe how she haunts the manor, to me, resonated very, very beautifully. But before we get there, (laughs) um, let's talk about good things about Bly. The Haunting of Bly Manor, what did you like, Nathaniel? I felt like the cinematography was gorgeous, the the way that the, the, the location was designed felt very authentic to the story in, in a really interesting way. Like it was very cool to see Bly Manor come to life in such a vivid way. It was it was absolutely gorgeous. The the scenes were well shot. I felt like a lot of the actors were very good. I would say the acting wasn't necessarily quite as consistent as with the Haunting of Hell House, but it was overall pretty solid. Like for example, I didn't love the uh, performances of of the girl who played Flora. I, I felt like she was definitely a, a kind of a weak point in the story. But as a whole, like I felt like the acting was good, and yeah, just the visuals were very stunning. Yeah, and I think in a lot of regards, Bly Manor itself became another character, and I love it when cinema does this. That the scenery or the set pieces really start to develop their own personality. And, and Blind Manor, to me in particular, the chapel and the lake really became 
ominous figures almost as powerful as the ghosts and i just thought that was really brilliant and that isn't really something that is present in the the source material and i like that i liked that blind manor became kind of something greater than the sum of its parts like it it it, the the location itself was haunting and uh really drove a lot of the story because it was just so naturally eerie in a way that felt not forced or, or contrived for sure. And I think you bring up a good point, too. The cinematography, what I really love about Blind Manor is it was simple. There wasn't any of this crazy cinematography going on or anything. It really just let the beauty of this beautiful scenery speak for itself. Um, the mansion that they filmed this at was stunning. The grounds were stunning. And it really helped create a scene, and it really helped develop uh, develop an atmosphere that was eerie not really scary it was very kind of ominous and foreboding but then at the same time it kind of had this warmth to it you know this family had lived in this manner they were struggling with loss it kind of brought this i don't know if you felt it too but this sense of home and for a, a movie about a haunted house i thought that was very very different than what we normally see. You know, typically a haunted house is so ominous and scary and you know it's haunted from a mile away. But this was welcoming. I, I definitely agree. And, and I think also something that, that kind of makes this piece stand on its own is how present this idea of, like, a found family is in the story. Like, that's not something that we typically see in horror. You know, a lot of times with horror, we tend to see broken families that are just crumbling and, and, you know, relationships going awry. But definitely with The Hunting of Blind Manor, for the most part, it's really a story about, like, people caring about each other and supporting each other and loving each other in spite of their shortcomings and, and things like that. You know, the, the staff at Blind Manor, so specifically, you know, we have Danny, who is the au pair, the equivalent of the, the governess. We have Jamie the gardener, we have Mrs. Gross, and we have Owen the cook. All of them were, were such fantastic characters in terms of just like feeling like people who really genuinely cared about each other and loved each other and supported each other in a really refreshing way, honestly. And I, I want to jump in and say something about Danny. Danny to me stole the show. Victoria Pedretti, I don't know if I've seen her in other things other than this. And but the way she Im- okay fair <laughs> forgot for a moment um, that, that she was Eleanor now in right Hellhouse. right but the way she just kind of embodied this like essence of this '90s girl just trying to figure out her life the way she moved the way she talked the way she held herself I was enthralled whenever Danny was in a scene I I, I don't know I was really really hypnotized by her performance in Bly Manor. I, I don't know what there was about it, but she brought an energy that is hard to find sometimes in TV series like this. You know, that actually kind of surprises me because I thought she was honestly like one of the weakest parts of the series. Well, and I, I, I think the difference there is as a queer individual, seeing her play someone queer and with those struggles, I think I may have identified with her a bit more, mm-hmm. and we can get to that a little bit later because that was one of the most moving points of this entire series to me. But I've heard, I, I have friends who say the same thing that they could not stand Danny and everything about her just made them cringe. And so uh, I just think it gives credit to a show like Bly that it can resonate with people in such different ways. For sure. And, and to me, to, to kind of clarify, to me, I felt like, yeah, the, the moments where she's dealing with the relationship that she had, you know, with her fiance that she broke up with just before he died in an unfortunate accident and, and that haunting her. Those moments actually I think worked really well for me and, and the way that she performed those worked really well for me. And, you know, her her guilt at basically coming out to her fiance and saying, like, hey, like I can't love you the same way that you love me those moments really, really worked for me, and I thought it was a fantastic performance. And so the the queer elements of her performance, I really liked. But seeing her as a person who was, like, interacting with the children and just kind of, like, hanging out around the house and hanging out with Mrs. Gross, 
to me, I felt like she just kind of felt, I don't know, one, her, I, I felt like her accent work was not convincing. It, it felt weirdly cartoonish to me in a way that was distracting. And, and I don't know, I just, I just didn't really buy her the rest of the time. I felt like there were moments where she really delivered. And, and honestly, like, it kind of surprised me that it didn't, that she didn't work for me because I felt like her performance in Hill House as Nell was just incredible. So, yeah, I don't know what it was, but it just didn't click for me. But there were moments when it did, but, but it just never consistently clicked for me, which is, I thought was a shame. And I agree with you that when you mentioned earlier that some of the acting was inconsistent, generally speaking, I thought everyone really brought a lot of effort to Bly Manor. However, yes. with that said, I agree with you. There were moments where I was wanting more, particularly from Flora, Jamie even I struggled with on occasion. I just felt she was mm. a bit one-dimensional in the beginning. Um, Hannah, I thought, was breathtaking. The character of Hannah, I thought, was one of the most dynamic in the entire series. And Miles, too, to some regard. Um, and, he... and to clarify, Hannah is Mrs. Gross. Oh, yes. Excuse me. Just, just so we're making sure, or make, making that clear to the audience, we're talking about the same person there. Sure. Um, and then also, Miss Jessel, what was her first name? I... No, Bex. Rebecca. Rebecca Jessel. I thought she also was a little underwhelming at some times. I thought mm -hmm. she wasn't reaching the same level as Peter Quint was. Yeah, he was a real lecherous Oh, sexy, lecherous bully. Oh, <laughs> I, I severely question uh, a lot of things if, if, if you found the way he behaved sexy. No, uh, the way he behaved was horrible, but the way he looked... Mm. Okay, that's fair. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that you weren't like turned on by very abusive men. No, 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 not in the slightest. Good. Um, I, I do want to point out, too, though, people who were a fan of Hill House... These two pieces of cinema are very different when it comes to the scare, I think. Yes. Hill House had me like on the edge of my couch, looking at everything in the background, trying to find what was happening. I was very invested in looking for the horror. Bly Manor, I think, takes a step back and really it just kind of lets it play out in a very almost poetic and melodic way. That's fine. But that comes off very boring to people, especially if you're expecting the type of horror that Hill House had. One thing that, that you have in the notes is that you did like the, that relationship between uh, Danny and Jamie. What, what worked for that, or worked in that for you? So the character of Danny, and here's a big spoiler, of course, you know, the, the first half of the show, she's seeing this man with these large, glowing eyes, and he kind of pops out in random spots or if she's feeling afraid or kind of emotional. And, and for me, that was the scariest part of Bly, even more so than Lady Bly. And we find out that, you know, she had some questions with her sexual orientation, but she had this, you know, high school sweetheart, we were told, and they were madly in love, and it was all very idyllic and very lovey, very romantic. And she finally had to come to terms with it, that, she loved him in a way that wasn't sexual. And I am under the belief that you can't fully love someone unless that sexual component is there. And so when I saw that coming from someone who has lived in her shoes in some regard, I, I really resonated with that emotion of mm -hmm. what do I do? I love this person to a certain extent. Do I have the courage to break it off? And Danny did. And unfortunately, I did not. Ultimately, though, she, she tells her betrothed this information and he ends up dying and she takes it as her fault that her coming out in some regard has killed this man and now he is going to forever haunt her. And, and to me, I think that was the superficial explanation of it. Mm. I understood it as a queer person that she was never comfortable with her orientation regardless of where she was in her life. Mm -hmm. um, she always allowed that insecurity and that doubt to haunt her. And whether it was her betrothed fiancé when she was young, and then she seemed to get over that by introduce, being introduced to Jamie, who was the gardener, and they had 
you know, a very kind of tongue in cheek relationship. And it was a homosexual relationship. She finally had what she was running away from. But I think in her heart of hearts and a big kind of metaphor of the show was she was still not okay with herself. She didn't love herself enough to love somebody else. And ultimately that allowed Lady Bly to possess her. Even as the years went on, she still, I don't think, ever came to terms with who she was as a person. Mm. Um, and ultimately it, it killed her. And so for me, coming from a queer perspective, struggling with a lot of those emotions, you know, what do I do? I love this individual, but I don't love them at the same time. What do I do? And then you break it off and it becomes something that haunts you, Nathaniel. I had a dream last night where I woke up in a fever sweat <laughs> because I, I thought I was in that relationship again. And you know how painful mm -hmm. that was for me. And so I really, I think, appreciated Danny's character and the dynamic between her and Jamie on a much deeper level because I've felt and experienced those emotions that they were trying to portray through her character arc. Um, and, and again, as a queer person, to see that representation play out and to see the actual trauma that can affect someone in their coming of age and coming out story, it was... It resonated with me to the point of tears. I cried a few times watching Danny struggle and especially the monologue with her and Jamie where Jamie kind of dived into this moonflower analogy and uh, I don't know, I just it was beautiful and I actually have pulled up the the monologue if I can read it. Okay. <laughs> um so this is all Jamie, of course, and and really she's focusing on death and trying to help Danny realize that she needs to let go of this this ghost. Everyone is exhaustive even the best ones. Sometimes, once in a blue, goddamned moon, I guess, someone like this moonflower might just be worth the effort. Look, I know you're struggling. I see it. I know you're carrying this guilt around, but I also know that you don't decide who lives and who doesn't. I'm sorry, Danny, but you don't. Humans are organic. It's a fact. We're all meant to die. It's natural. Beautiful. And it all breaks down and rises back up and breaks down again, and every living thing grows out of every dying thing. We leave more life behind us to take our place. That life refreshes and recycles, and on and on it goes. And that is so much better than that life getting crushed deep down into the dirt, into a rock that will burn if it's old enough. So much better to see the leafling and flower. We leave more life behind to take our own place, like this moonflower. I don't know, I just, Nathaniel, I thought that was so poetic, not only from a sense of life and death and being mindful with what we have now, but also loving yourself enough to live life to its fullest, to be a moonflower, to not be, you know, a piece of garbage that will essentially turn into a lump of coal one day. So anyway, I, that that's all sounded very philosophical, but I, I think that's why I personally like Bly Manor more than Hill House, is because these deep, deep metaphors of life just resonated with me on a very special and intimate level. Personally liked components of Danny and Jamie's relationship, but at the end of the day, I felt like Jamie wasn't a strong enough, like fleshed out enough character for me to fully buy into their relationship. Oh, oh, I let me make something clear. Like I agree with that, but I I more appreciated what they stood for, not like the actual concreteness of the relationship, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, okay, uh, I, I, I think I think yeah. To me, that that that's exactly like I I agree with that one hundred percent. But to me, I think I, I put a lot of value on not just what something is working as symbolically, but rather also how it plays out literally in the story. And to me, it was weaker on the literal end, and I I think that's a shame because it was I think otherwise a very uh, important component of the of the story that worked really well in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with you there. And I think that is the biggest flaw with Bly Manor is it tried to execute things out on a literal manner and it, it just came up short. A lot of Bly Manor did really well. Uh, you're kind of moving away from the, the relationship of Danny and uh, Jamie is looking at the relationship between Quint and Jessel versus, er, relative to the children, Miles and Flora. 
you know, that was the, as I mentioned before, that kind of the driving relationship in a lot of ways in the novella and in uh, the Innocence film was, you know, kind of the way that these adults use these children sort of to their advantage. I want to cut in and just say that I think even further than that, not only were they using the children, but I think the children were looking for people to replace their parents. And so what was this double toxic situation where Peter Quint and Miss Jessel understood that to some regard and manipulated the hell out of it. And it was disgusting to watch. Exactly. And, and to me, like that was one of the high points of the series in terms of really fleshing that out, you know, showing how these children were extremely vulnerable you know, they, they lost their parents, and, and, and like, that stuff is, is present in the source material, but it doesn't really dig into it in the same meaningful ways. And so seeing it in Bly Manor and really seeing that component of the story pop was awesome. Because, to me, yeah, it really showed that Quint and Jessel were villains in really interesting ways. Now, you know, Jessel tries to redeem herself in some ways. You know, she, she is largely under a very uh, strong thumb of Quint in, in the ways that he manipulates her uh, and abuses her. But, you know, ultimately, like, both of them were doing very villainous, awful things to these children, both in life and as ghosts. And I liked seeing that and, and seeing the way that the children felt that need to make these adults happy and and to you know kind of have them in the the sort of pseudo parent roles for them and and to see that trust getting abused so flagrantly really was a a strong point in the series for me I, i think how they set up the show they wanted you to feel compassion and some sympathy for miss jessel yeah for sure she she's not wholly bad but i don't think peter quint was wholly bad either but i think what happened though is they became so self-absorbed in their own wants and desires that they used or they started to see the children as a tool to to the end um and whenever you treat children like tools it's not okay and so i even though miss jessel was incredibly influenced by peter quint i i felt like she was still an educated enough and kind of independent enough character to realize that and quint himself is just a master manipulator of course um and i don't want this to sound like i'm blaming the victim but i think jessel and quint together were worse than you know the the horror complex that is the lady of blight manor what they did was child abuse if we you know call it as it is for sure and 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 i think yeah like looking at jessel from the very beginning it's not like she got lured into manipulating these children for her own gain. Like, that was her goal from the very beginning, was I am going to be this au pair for these kids, so that way I can try to leverage that to skip ahead and uh, of a lot of the traditional stuff for getting a, a job in this law firm. That is really psychologically damaging to, to those children to not know that someone is using them that way. So that that is definitely present, and yeah, to me, like, they are the real interesting villains of, of the series, and, and they really did become very jarringly villainous. And I, as much as Peter Quint was good to look at, um, he, uh, I haven't seen a horror villain like that in a while. The calculating, the dynamic kind of relationship building he had with everyone at Bly Manor, I don't know, his character fascinated me because I think he was so well thought out and what his motives were from start to finish the only disappointment was the ending which we'll get to (laughs) yes yeah that that dude's real good at being a skeezy guy he was he was real skeezy and uh invisible man too i think we can talk a little bit about the metaphors and the other lessons throughout the show after we talk about some of the negatives fly manor i think is just chock full of lessons and life values that you can learn And again, I'm probably going to sound very hippy-dippy, esoteric, philosophical, but I've talked to a few people and everyone pulled out different messages and meanings out of Bly Manor, and I think that, in some regard, is the testament of why this story has persisted so long. 
that it means so many different things to different people. It's interpretive in different ways. Whether it's a good kind of representation or bad, I really think its heritage owes to the fact that love is dynamic and mm. very subjective to the person. Well, should we maybe shift into some of the cons now? Yeah, I want to start out with our cons that when you finish the show, you sent me a text message and I repeat, or I quote, Max, Haunting of Bly Manor just pooped the bed. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I laughed out loud. Yeah, so let's talk about this ending. As we've mentioned, I think the storytelling up to the end was incredibly dynamic, well thought out. It may have been a little episodic sometimes, which felt forced. But overall, the narrative and the plot were, were really interesting and well done, and mm -hmm. I thought very masterful. And then the ending, they just pushed the, bra or pushed the gas pedal to like 90 miles an hour in the but worst ways. If we look at the last episode, the first five minutes very hastily, haphazardly ties up all of the threads that it had built up up until that point. Yeah, within like I, ten minutes. Yeah, it's, it's literally, yeah, five or ten minutes of that episode. Is it suddenly like, oh, the Lady of Bly gets sent back to the lake by a really convenient plot device that kind of just... Danny just happens to say the right thing by happenstance, I guess. And suddenly, and, and even though other characters had said that around the lady, it, it finally clicked and she just goes back into the lake and everything's hunky-dory there. Very weak and made me very frustrated as, a, as an audience member. The stories of the, the villains, you know, Jessel and Quint... They they're basically just kind of pushed off to the side. Oh, they they're they're free now from from Bly Manor, so they don't they're not stuck here trying to manipulate these children anymore, and they feel bad about it, and then they just leave. Well, yeah, and that was the most frustrating part that we just spent seven or eight damn episodes learning about all of these character developments and connections, and then when the Lady of Bly is absolved, everyone's just like, okay, peace. <laughs> yeah, we were bad guys, but maybe you're not anymore! Like, Peter Quint and Miss Jessel were just like, okay, see you later. Hannah, even, was just... Uh, it was a discredit to all of that character development that we had. Yes. Ugh, that's uh, the part that gets me the most. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. That the characters I cared about the most, that I was most invested in, they too just kind of stopped mattering. The the uncle who has been a crappy uncle and distant and all of that, we're going to get into him more in just a second, rest assured. But yeah, he just kind of like shows up and he's like, I felt bad about everything now. Children, I love you. Let's go leave. We're never coming back here again. And so then the kids are gone. And so then the rest of the episode was about Danny and Jamie like, going off and having a wonderful life together until... But the Lady of Bly slowly draws Danny back by the end. And, like, that could be interesting, but... It should have been two episodes, I think. We should have had an episode where we really saw the conflict between Peter and Jessel. And I don't think Peter would have just been like, Okay, bye! He spent all of that time really manipulating everyone. He wanted to get what he wanted. Yeah. And so had we an episode where it talked about them and their true redemption and maybe seeing a little bit more of the uncle kind of coming to his own of, I need to take care of these kids, that would have been awesome. And then have the finale be the Jamie Danny story kind of right back at the wedding. Just, it pulled a Game of Thrones last season where they tried to do everything in one episode. And I don't know if it was a budgetary thing or a creative mistake or what, but it was really too fast. Yeah. Too fast. Yeah, it just, it tied up so much, so sloppily. And, 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 and like, again, like, to me, like, the most interesting part of the story, the most important part of the story was Quint and Jessel being manipulative and evil and, you know, manipulating these children. 
and it literally just like they're like, "Oh, we're ba- our bad, bye." And then suddenly everything was good for the kids. The kids get shoved off to the side, and then we have forty minutes of fried green tomatoes. And like, there's there's a place in the world for fried green tomatoes. I think it's a great story. I just don't need it in place of actually tying up my turn of the screw. Like, give me, you know, what is actually going on with, you know, what these guys are trying to attempt. You know, these villainous ghosts. Give me my villains actually doing villainous things in the last bit. Actually raise the stakes there. To me, it felt like the Lady of Bly was this weird deus ex machina in that (laughs) she... She arrived at random times, wreaked havoc, and then dipped out, and then at this point, she had the right magic word said to her, so now everyone's good, everything's magical. Like, her story was interesting, and I really liked the backstory episode about her, but ultimately, even considering how much I enjoyed watching that episode, it didn't matter. Like, the, the it, it was a different story. It was... It felt like someone had an idea for a separate ghost story and just kind of tacked it in there. It didn't mesh. I think it was a tool to try and force a metaphor at the very end of the series. If they really wanted to kind of make Lady of Bly a figurehead, she needed to be some sort of you know spider-weaving machination kind of a thing at the very beginning of the series. Uh, Flanagan made us believe that Peter Quint and Jessel were the enemies, and then at the, you know, the penultimate episode, oh, it's this ghost, and the ghost is the one trapping everybody, and I, I think it would have worked a lot better had we been introduced to who the Lady of Bly was, episode one or episode two, so we at least knew what was happening in some regard, and then followed that through to the very end. And it would have made the metaphor that which she stands for, I think, much more impactful. I, 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 it was just frustrating. It was frustrating. Well, and, and like even just looking at like her role in the story up until that point, like again, she kind of didn't matter. The only reason that she mattered at all is that she was the reason that Quint and Jessel were dead. Right. But other than that, she had really no impact other than just being a wild card to... Me- to- wreak havoc and and look creepy she didn't actually do anything for the overall plot up until the very end and so to me it was just really weak writing there and and i think that's a shame because the yeah that like individual episode is, is a great like standalone story real real fun real cool it was black and white i liked it a lot i really like you know the actress who plays the lady of bly um she she's fantastic in everything. She was fantastic in Hell House. She's fantastic in all of her husband's uh, stuff. She's uh, the the wife of Mike Flanagan. She rocks. You know, it's Kate Siegel, and and I yeah, I love what she does. But it doesn't mean that she fit in terms of the story. <laughs> well, and for me, the Lady of Bly's story was a very tragic one. Mm-hmm. It, it embodied a lot of, I think. At the time that she died, what was it? Let's say the early 1900s. I don't know. It was kind of vague. Yeah, uh, but she was very feminist, very progressive for her time, and she prided herself on being able to be independent and in control. And then she gets the lung and, and really kind of becomes a shell of herself, loses her humanity to some regard, and then tries to put whatever she has left in her worldly possessions dies and essentially becomes trapped in purgatory waiting for her daughter to essentially become the heir of her worldly possessions and only to find out that her sister is planning on selling them and so this grief and rage and acts of love for her daughter which i think are big themes for the show become this well of gravity it's so dense that it almost becomes a black hole and Bly just traps anyone who dies in its grounds. And that, to me, as a horror, uh, horror aficionado, I haven't seen something like that yet. And this idea that someone's rage and hate can be as dense as a black hole and just suck everything towards it, I, it blew my mind. But then, 
they had one episode to resolve the damn thing. Yeah. And it made me mad because that was such a unique idea and it was like they wasted it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what bothers me too is that that is a fantastic idea, but it has nothing to do with the rest of the story. It is a really cool idea that could have been a really cool movie or something like that if it was its own story. But it's tacked onto a story that it doesn't belong to. But yeah, like that idea of the gravity of her, so cool, so great, would have fit really well in a story that is actually about her. Well, and again, had it been at the beginning, I think it really would have helped. We would have understood a little bit more of Quince and Jessel's motives and the real finality of what they were doing, that they are trapped. All they wanted to do when they were living was get out, but this black hole is keeping them here, so they will go as far as child abuse to escape. That, I think, is much more thought out than just tacking this on at the end because they want to make a ghost story. Let's let's jump into something else that didn't work for me. Let's talk about the uncle. I don't think I actually included this in our notes, but the uncle, uh, that whole story, kind of didn't ever quite gel for me in a, in a meaningful way. I felt like there, the episode that, that featured him prominently, where it kind of explores, okay, he's actually Flora's dad, he was having an affair with his brother's wife, and and he's haunted by guilt, and all of that. Like that, that again, that was kind of a, a cool standalone story, but it didn't fit. Like, the, the imagery of, like, the, the creepy, smiling guilt monster that is haunting him, that is himself, was cool, but what did that have to do with the rest of the story? It didn't fit in. It, it kind of didn't have the same logic. Which is a shame, because it, it was a cool, like, creepy image, but again, not really by manner. <laughs> well, and again... The uncle, I think, was the most problematic of everybody, including the Lady of Bly, because he just was a puff of wind. I did not care about him. Like you say, I think his episode was really intriguing as a standalone short story, Mm -hmm. but it, it really, it was like that puzzle piece that you can't find the last piece, and so you force one that's not supposed to go into the puzzle. It just felt out of place. And I, I think that brings us to one of the biggest flaws of The Haunting of Bly, is that every episode, to some degree, felt like a little story on its own. It felt like an anthology within an anthology. Everyone had their origin story. Everyone had their motive story. And I don't know, it it felt disjointed. Yes. Um, Taking a step back and looking at it, you know, metaphors and life lessons to be learned aside, as a, a piece of film, it struggles as a narrative. I, I agree 100%. And, and I think it, you know, it was trying to do the same thing that Hill House did. Because Hill House is definitely structured that way, especially the first five episodes, you know, kind of having the main character for each of those episodes. You know, each of the kids gets one major episode, and then we kind of resolve the story from there. So it was definitely taking a chapter from that. But the difference is, and, and I think this is you know one of the things that ended up being a big problem, is that it wasn't necessarily the same pe- person making all of it. Mike Flanagan is the showrunner for Blind Manor, but he didn't direct everything and he didn't write everything. He, and he, I didn't he, know that. Yeah, the, Mike Flanagan did all of Hill House. He was the the director for all of Hill House, but he directed a single episode of Blind Manor. He he uh, he did episode one. Besides that. We have, let's see, one, two, three, four directors who did two episodes each, and then, th- you know, three, including Flanagan, that did one. And, and then, you know, a lot of those people, as well as a, another, you know, whole uh, bunch of writers, were the ones who were uh, writing these episodes. And so it it was disjointed because it, it wasn't the same, it wasn't the same creator, and it wasn't necessarily the same team making everything to, uh, in the same way, and making sure that everything felt cohesive. And, and I feel like that shows. It, it definitely made it very uneven. Um, and, and, like, some shows can definitely pull that off, but I would say, you know, it, it's the same kind of thing that you see with a lot of TV series, where there are episodes that really, really work, and those tend to be the ones that, like, the showrunner directs. A uh, great example of this would be Buffy. Some of the best episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer are the ones directed by Joss Whedon. But Joss Whedon, especially after, like, that first season, 
really only does like one or two episodes a season. And so, like, those tend to be the high points. You know, he usually does, like, maybe the start or the last episode or, or some, you know, important, significant episode somewhere in between. But other than that, it, it isn't necessarily as consistent. And with a show that's only nine episodes long, you want it to be consistent. You have to. You can't afford for it to not be. Some other kind of more minor things. I felt like everyone falling in love was a bit much for me. I didn't need... Uh, Mrs. Gross and Owen to be in love. I, I like that they like. I felt like they could have had a a nice, fun, happy relationship without them being in love with each other. Just felt very convenient that everyone just had to have a romance story. And also, like, there's a lot of like time loop components to it. And I felt like they just kind of overused that. It, th- there were too many scenes that were shown to us over and over and over again in a way that, I don't know, I just felt like each episode could have just done it one or two times less and it would have been that much stronger. Is there anything else we need to rant about at the end? <laughs> <sighs> um, no, nah, I think I've, I've, I've ranted enough. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll speak up if something else comes to mind, but like, it, it just, it, I wanted it to really deliver because it was just killing it with the turn of the screw stuff and, and really developing it more, and then it just didn't deliver the goods and it makes me so mad because i wanted it to it promised me something and it didn't give it to me um i i did kind of want to talk about a few of the things i pulled out from the narrative as a whole again taking a step back understanding that it has a lot of flaws looking at it from a philosophical kind of point of view what lessons were kind of pulled out of that and for me uh, th- i've already kind of talked ad nauseum about it but the the identity of danny as a queer individual and her mm-hmm. acceptance of her orientation mm-hmm. haunting her to her death i thought was done very very well i, I th- also think that it tackles grief loss guilt rage very very well um as kind of disjointed as the lady of Blythe felt i think her story was poetic and it gave us that you know, dense hatred and rage of guilt, loss, anger, uh, creating this black hole of energy. I, I almost want to say that's what I believe about ghosts, Nathaniel, because it just, it resonated so much with me, and I, I believe in energies, and when someone does something very bad, it kind of leaves its mark on that area, and mm-hmm. this was just another level of that that I really liked. Yeah, and, and those themes are definitely all very present with the uncle story as well. And, and and unfortunately, yeah, those are are the two most disjointed characters from the rest of the series, which I yeah, it, it's it's a shame because like those are I think really interesting themes to explore here, especially with a ghost story. Um, another one that I really loved was you know finding and then losing that love and how vulnerable humanity can be sometimes to mm-hmm. find someone that you're attracted to and then the world just kind of stops. And then you lose that person and the world stops in a different way. Me and my daughter have been listening to the Beetlejuice musical on loop. She loves it. And Lydia sings a song right at the very beginning where her mother dies. And she talks about how the sun won't shine anymore because she's lost her mother. And I think that relates here to Bly a lot. That instead of focusing on what you've lost, you need to really try and be focusing on what memories you had and keeping that person alive in some regard in your life, thinking about them. And this was nicely done with Jamie at the end of the series, still searching out Danny wherever she went. I thought that was a nice little nod to never forget the people you've lost. And at the beginning of the show, there was a man at the wedding who just threw out this random quote, and I wrote it down when I heard it because I loved it so much. Um, to truly love another person is to accept the work of loving them is worth the pain of losing them. And that, to me, is love. Unconditional love. I, I don't know. I really like that. <laughs> I, I would say that maybe it, it, it beat that drum a little bit too much throughout the series, in that, like, literally every single character has that, like, nonstop. But I did like that theme. I think, yeah, they could have maybe trimmed it back a little bit because we don't need every single character to show us that in great detail. Yeah, I agree. I think Hannah and Owen's relationship didn't need to be a romantic one per se. It would have been cool to see the different types of love being represented. The love between siblings, between friends, and then between romantic partners. That would have been, it would have enhanced the metaphor 
quite a bit. Um, we've already kind of talked about adults using children to be used for certain motives. Yes. Um, anything else you wanted to say about that? Um, no, I feel like you know we, we definitely covered that pretty well. And another uh, strong theme is is just like the way that obsession and and abusive relationships work, and how that you know carries such a, a powerful weight on one's life and and make affects how they think, how they you know the, their values, everything. It was definitely a very present one as well. And I, I find found that that one was very well done uh, in, in in a lot of it. But again, maybe sometimes it was, was thrown at us a little bit too heavy, heavy-handedly. Great example there is, you know, we, we, we see it very vividly and, and well, in a well-executed way with that relationship between Jessel and Quint. But I didn't need to have, you know, scenes where Quint is stuck in a time loop where his awful parents are manipulating him and... You know all of the insinuations that his dad molested him and all that kind of stuff. I didn't. I didn't need that. It didn't necessarily yeah. add anything to that conversation uh, in a meaningful way. In, in, in some regard, I think the moral of the story here with Bly is it was trying too hard. Yes. Um, I think the metaphors were there, and the creators and directors really needed to just take a breath. And let them play out naturally instead of nailing them in the head with our the largest, you know, Mjolnir's hammer as much as possible, you know? Yeah, I don't need to get bludgeoned with a theme. Just show me the theme. Let me explore it myself. So, since I, I think that covers the, the themes that we were talking about, can I jump one back or back to one more thing that I hated about the show? <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> because I, I just realized I have not talked about it yet, and it, I think, needs to be said. Screw the frame narrative. Screw it. It is so bad. It was awful. It was so awful. I don't need this to be Flora's wedding and she's forgotten about all this and it's all secretly being told to us by by Jamie and this is all her her way of sharing her her love story and and her relationship with Danny. And they're all there, but they all look a little different. And some of them know what's going on with her story, and other ones don't. And it was bad, guys. It was real bad. I hated it. It made me so inordinately angry to to see that. Oh, it's a like like if it was just a frame story, if it was just a storytelling thing, and it was sort of a nod to the original, just because like oh hey, it's just being told to us, and and that kind of forms uh, some of the narration. It would have been dumb, but I would have at least accepted it. But when it's like, oh, it was secretly her, and no one, and these kids didn't remember anything bad that happened, and this and that, I'm just like, nope, nope, nope. This is just stupid now. I'm, I'm just angry. Like it, it made that last episode go from me being like really frustrated and how it tied things up to just really, really mad when the, when the credits rolled because I'm like, really, you had to make the frame story just atrociously stupid like i'm not an idiot i don't need this kind of thing <laughs> thanks for coming to our ted talk <laughs> yeah don't have a stupid frame narrative where people conveniently forget stuff and then get told it in a mysterious way at their wedding it's just <laughs> stupid it's just freaking stupid i don't know if i've ever seen you this riled up i'm quite enjoying this rage <laughs> well, it is it is righteous rage. It is one hundred percent warranted. I am a, I am a smart enough audience member to not need that kind of bullcrap in my in my media. Like, just don't do it. It's dumb. It doesn't contribute anything. It just tried to make us go. Oh, it was heard the whole time. No, that's stupid. Don't 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 do that. Um, I we did ask a few people to kind of give us their opinions again. Kind of going back to a few of the positives about yes, the haunting yes. of Bly. There, 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 are, there um, are positives. The messages that it kind of speaks to people. I think it's really interesting to hear others' thought. So two people that I know who have watched it recently, they finished before I did even, were my sister and then I have a coworker and her mother. And my sister thought that what she loved the most was a, the feminist themes that she identified with. Empowerment, the struggle to fit a specific mold, the balance of power between fitting in by what we are told and what we really are. Um, she really liked the Lady of Bly Manor. She didn't 
come across mean or powerful, but she was able to execute her dreams, even if it meant losing her humanity to some regard. My sister also thought it was a love story at the end of the day, and how different love can look like to different people, and sometimes whether that love hurts you or helps you. And then finally she said that she really loved that it was a horror story that ended with a good happy ending. It's like, oh, oh darling. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my the other people I asked, they thought that the entire story represented past demons and how we as individuals make the choice to either let those past demons and regrets control our lives, ultimately leading us to our doom, or forgiving ourselves, loving ourselves, and moving on to be happy and finding the good things day to day. Did you ask your wife about it, Nathaniel? Oh, well, I was right there with her. Um, we watched it together. Uh, so, so, yeah, this is Taylor. She has been on the show a couple of times. If you think the last episode made me mad, you should have seen her. She was just livid. She, she turned to me and was like, really? You made me watch this show, and like now I have wasted all of this time. Like She was so angry by that last episode. And proceeded... That statement... Don't forget that statement, because that is kind of how I want to end this episode. Yes. And so, yeah, so she was so mad. And then, you know, so we, we watched it, you know, it was about an hour long episode. And then for the next three hours, she ranted about how mad she was about it and like picked it apart piece by piece at, <laughs> at much greater length than anything I did. So she was so angry at that ending. Also, uh, another thing is that she really didn't necessarily yeah love how heavy handed it was with some of those those things uh that uh that your sister pointed out uh like like the feminist ideas and things like that she she just felt like it was very very tropey with those like it didn't necessarily add anything interesting to the conversation it just kind of was like you know feminism is good and she's like yeah i'm like Feminism is good, like, it's important to be treated like a human being, but, like, what are you trying to say? Like, I don't know, it just, the, the heavy-handedness of the feminist themes, especially episode about the Lady of the Bly, of Bly Manor, and, and how, like, strong she was as a woman, so I guess she's like, but this isn't actually, like, representing life in a realistic way. Um, it, it felt too cartoonish to her, and... That was kind of interesting to to have as as her perspective there. So, I'm fascinated by that. I wonder. I'm gonna say, I, I wonder the life experience between the two. You know, what as why they interpreted it differently. I think that's fascinating. Yeah. And as a straight man, or not a straight man, whoa, as a gay ah. white man, <laughs> like it's it's just a frame that I I can't understand. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can understand it on a logical level, but you know, I am not a woman, so I say nothing more <laughs> that is fair you brought up a very very good point that i want to talk about because i've been thinking about this for a while i've seen a few shows where the ending is as you quote poops the bed <laughs> and do you think that if a bad ending to a show the rest of the integrity of the, the tv series or the movie or whatever you're watching is it ruined is there anything worth salvaging for example um, I know you're not a Game of Thrones fan, but the ending of Game of Thrones was incredibly controversial to people, to the point where people threw out the entire series as a whole because the ending did not go how they wanted. And while I agree to some regard, I didn't love the ending. I don't think my time was wasted watching everything prior to the ending. I may not have agreed with the artistic direction that the ending was laid out in. But that doesn't mean that the memories and the enjoyment that I got up to that point are null and void now. And I think the same is true with Bly Manor. Overall, I liked Bly better than Hill House because I resonated with its themes more so than I did with Hill. And just because the ending was shitty doesn't mean that that resonation is any less powerful to me. Your thoughts, Nathaniel, what do you say? I think it depends on the piece. There are definitely things where I can go like, ah, it fizzled at the end, but as a whole, I still like it. There are things where, but, but yeah, on, on the flip side, there are things where the ending makes me so angry 
that I feel like I have wasted my time, my investment in it, my emotional whatever that 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 you know it almost in retrospect makes everything else bad. So I think yeah, part of that is the kind of the nature of the story. You know, is it a mystery? Is it like like what is is the kind of the driving force in me enjoying the piece? Because you know, with with something like Blind Manor, I would say it it kind of did hurt it for me in a in a pretty significant way. The bad ending because to me, I wanted it to pay off in a meaningful way. I wanted it like it felt like it was building towards something. It was it was creating this mystery. It was developing the story, and so even though there are parts I like about it a great deal, as a whole. It just it, it it failed to stick the landing in such a, a powerful way that it kind of just soured the whole experience for me. Because then I then I look back at everything that led up to it that was driving or you know that was that was pulling me in and making me enjoy it and go, but those don't actually go anywhere. And so that is I think kind of maybe the the, the key distinction there. And another great example of this is the series the series of The Mentalist. Uh, I really liked that TV series a lot, and it had a really strong. Uh, overarching story about this main character trying to like hunt down this serial killer that murdered his family. The way that they tied up that story was so incredibly mediocre that it made all of the the build up meaningless because basically what it said to me was, okay, you guys were just throwing stuff out there as writers and you didn't actually have a way to tie it up in a meaningful, worthwhile way, you were just pretending like you were better writers than you actually are. Like, that doesn't work for me. That doesn't satisfy me. Now, like, yeah, there are things that just, like, kind of end in a way that's dissatisfying, but when the ending is kind of the whole point of the story, then, yeah, it, I think it, it has such strong reverberations backwards that it make, it undoes a lot of the things that was good before. Does that make sense? Am, am I making any logical connections here no it it makes perfect sense and i think it just again kind of comes down to a matter of subjectivity because for me even shows like how i met your mother (laughs) which i i loved uh has one of the worst show endings of all time i think the show it wasn't about the ending of the show to me it was a general kind of a feeling that i love the show it's now an end it's at an end Didn't love the ending, but that doesn't mean I don't love the show any less. And same goes for Game of Thrones, for Haunting of Bly. I I think for you, sometimes it is a little bit more literal, and you want the ending to be a nice cornerstone on everything. And for me, I think it's more about the journey than the destination. Which it isn't... I'm not saying one is worse or the other. I'm just saying they're two different personalities watching the same, you know, medium. And I love that. I love that it's different. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, and and I think to be fair, like you know, I I agree. Like for example, with uh, how I met your mother as as a great example here. I also thought the ending was hot garbage, but I still also enjoy the stuff that led up to it for the most part because even though like yes, the name of the show is How I Met Your Mother, and it was all leading to that, and then it just kind of crapped the bed at the end. It was still really ultimately a, a show that you watched because you liked the characters and like the way that they interact with each other and you like humor. And so it, it, it still doesn't necessarily take away from those components because those things are still very strong even though the overarching story ended up kind of failing. Like, you weren't really there for the overarching story. You were there because the characters were fun. While with this kind of story, you're kind of, at least for me personally, I was there because I wanted a great ghost story that came together in a, in a cool way and it didn't deliver that and so so yeah i think what it what it boils down to more than anything else is what is the thing that is driving you as a viewer you know is it a mystery plot is it the characters is it whatever and that is going to inform what works or doesn't work for you in the conclusion you know, what promises yeah. do you feel like as an audience member you're being made? I think this is, this is the same reason why I don't love the end of the Harry Potter series. And most people do. But to me, I think, you know, a lot of people who really love it, it, it might be because they have such a deep love of the characters, when the characters actually weren't necessarily the big thing that was driving it for me. I was, I think, more pulled into the story 
I didn't feel satisfied with the way that the story resolved. And I, I love this idea that your your motives in watching the show really affect how you feel about the ending. I, I think that's going to change how I watch a lot of stuff. I have a problem with watching the ending of shows because they do make me very sad, as you are aware. Yes. <laughs> um, it takes you way have long not to watch yet... like, the last episode of things. <laughs> I, I just watched the ending to Parks and Rec and The Office earlier this year, um, <laughs> and it was a very emotional time for me. But I have one episode left to The Good Place, and I've loved The Good Place so much that it's very difficult for me <laughs> to watch that ending episode. That one's important. You need to watch the last episode. But that, that, is, that is neither here nor there with what we're talking about. For the, it's the true. Thing. It's true. Let's move on. <laughs> so, as far as Screams go. I originally gave it a four, but after thinking it through in our dialogue today, I'm going to drop it down to a three. It really is not scary. Agreed. Yeah, I gave it a three as well. It it has a few real great spooky moments. It has some really great like spooky set pieces, but again, but ultimately it just it, it failed to deliver the scares by and large. Browns, what did you give it? Um, I gave it a six. Uh, the ending dropped it down. I wanted to give it like an eight, but that ending was just. The more I think about the ending, the more it kind of frustrates me. And originally, when it finished, I was like, "Okay, that wasn't too bad." And then thirty minutes later, it was like, "Oh, but Peter, Peter Quint and Jessel, they just kind of poofed out of nowhere." Oh, the kids. Ah, oh, the frame narrative was kind of hokey. And so, as the days have gone by, it's dropped to a six. Yeah, for me, it is a solid five, because mostly that last episode, and also, you know, the, uh, just the stuff that I talked about already. I would say if it had delivered the goods, it would have been a nine, honestly. Like, I really like a lot about this story, but it just didn't quite work. I really wish I could give it a higher score than that, because I really wanted it to stick the landing. Moving Along, should we end our episode with our lovely staying spooky? Yes, absolutely. How have you been staying spooky, Max? Good. I'm glad I'm going first because your news is exciting and mine, my staying spooky is not. <laughs> I'm staying spooky and I just realized that I should add to this. I watched the Hulu adaptation of The Books of Blood by Clive Barker. Clive Barker is one of my... Favorite authors of all time, The Thief of Always will be and forever will be one of my favorite books. The Hulu movie is trash. It's so bad. Ooh, it was infuriating how bad it was. It is three mini movies inside a movie with a fourth mini movie that is like, oh, they're all tied together. Surprise. And I was just furious. I was so upset. Such a disservice to our Lord and Savior, Clyde Barker. I just crossed myself. No one could see me. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I really liked a lot of the stories in the Books of Blood, so that's really a shame. Yeah, I'm reading it now, and the, the stories within the Books of Blood itself are just so much better than what they tried to do in that movie. I don't know, anthologies struggle for me. Whether it's one movie, uh, really, I can only think of Trick or Treat that's done a well job, or the original VHS. I hate Trick or Treat, so... Uh, I mean... It's fun. I don't think it's, you know, okay. Okay. Hate is too strong giant of a horror it's, it's, movie. <laughs> yeah, and, and to be fair, before I get people coming at me on Twitter, I don't hate Trick or Treat. I just think it's profoundly mediocre. <laughs> before I let you share your exciting news, I did watch Books of Blood the same night that me and a coworker went on a ghost tour of Ogden, and that was something that was so fun. I'm so glad I did it. I want to do it more. I tried to record EVPs, but the tour guide we were with explicitly told us not to record anything or we would be fined. So I did not. I'm sorry, listeners. One day I will. You just, you know, s- slipped it in your pocket. I know. I, you know me and following rules. It's the worst. Nerd. <laughs> All right. Cut the crap. Tell us your exciting news, Nathaniel. All right. So my very exciting news is that just about a week, about two weeks ago, I was published. So I was published in a horror anthology book. The the book is titled The Witching Time of Night, the Salt City Genre Writers 2020 Horror Anthology. 
it is available for purchase on Amazon. So if you have Kindle Unlimited, it is free. So you should definitely check that out. It is also uh, $8 to buy the Kindle version, and it's also now available on paperback for $20 on Amazon. So if anyone is interested in checking it out, I highly recommend it. There are some real fun stories outside of my own, but the, the story that I wrote, which is called Leftover Monstrosities, is a short story that I am very proud of. I think it is very solid. Uh, it's definitely one of the, the best pieces I have written to date i think it is hopefully up up your alley listeners because it's it's quite uh dark and twisted and gory and uh, is inspired partially by uh some stuff about jeffrey Dahmer. so if any of that appeals to you you, uh, just check it out let me know what you think i would love to talk to anyone about how, how they feel about my short story i i am really thrilled that i have something out there that is you know, something that people can engage with. So very excited about that. So in in, in some ways, I've had two babies lately. <laughs> All right. Well, if that is it, thank you for listening about The Haunting of Bly Manor. Wasn't it perfectly splendid? I don't know if it was spooky enough, so I think y'all should stay spooky. Need even more Scream Kings? Here's our obligatory shameless social media plug. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Scream Kings Pod. You could also email us at ScreamKingsPodcast at gmail.com. Help us reach a wider audience of horror fans by leaving a review on iTunes or by sharing a link on social media. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash Scream Kings. Stay spooky.